Hello, everyone. I'm Hayden Zeiss, your host, and I want to welcome you to the Raising Returns Real Estate Podcast. Our main goal is to provide you with real information and ideas that are going to help you understand the way that you want to invest in real estate. Whether you're a passive or active real estate investor, I can guarantee you that you're going to learn something new on this podcast. Today's guest is John Gleason. He's a private real estate attorney, over 30 years of experience. He was the in-house attorney for Crawford and Hoying and a partner at Porter Wright. He's a general and corporate real estate work attorney. John, thank you so much for uh, joining us. Really appreciate it. Thank, uh, thanks for having me. I'm uh, glad to be on and participate and hope uh, we can provide the listeners with uh, at least some information to think about. I guess I have to do my legal uh, disclaimer first of, you know, this is kind of just general information. It's not legal advice for any particular, uh, you know, issue or things like that. But if anybody has questions, I'd uh, be happy to, uh, you know, talk to you later or, um, you know, we can we can reach out um, and, and discuss things in the, in the future. But uh, happy to uh, address some topics that uh, hopefully are beneficial and informational to the listeners today. No, absolutely. Well, John, you, you <laughs> actually, the way I we met each other was you actually helped draw up all of our offering documents at Lana Sarah Investments, the company that I co-founded. And I can personally attest that John is extremely knowledgeable on all different types of topics on real estate. And that's one of the reasons that we wanted to have you on. But um, let's just jump right into it. I, I really want to learn, let our listeners know a little bit about you and how you ended up getting into corporate and real estate law. Well, I, as you say, I, I, I know a lot because I'm getting older and older every day, <laughs> which I've learned, uh, especially through this uh, the pandemic we're dealing with. I've been home a lot more than I would normally be home. And have been looking through old pictures and really realizing how old I am. But uh, <laughs> I started, uh, yeah, 30, almost 33 years ago. Uh, I actually started as a, a litigator or somebody that did uh, trial work and uh, did a lot of uh, a lot of that until the late 80s when we had a, uh, a real estate you know uh, issue that, that happened then, and I got into real estate workouts representing both lenders and borrowers, uh, renegotiating loans, doing real estate bankruptcies, um, which really, I think, showed me both sides of the, the spectrum of you know all the different areas that you have when you're dealing with real estate. Uh, unfortunately, at that time, it was dealing with distressed real estate. And then I got into uh, real estate development after that. Some of the folks that I had worked with, uh, with their distressed properties, then hired me to help them as things got better. And, you know, things did uh, get better for many, many years until we had the, the last uh, recession or uh, in, in the 2008-9 time frame. And uh, so did more real estate workouts. And then things, again, started to get better and began working with, you know, real estate developers um, and investors like uh, yourself and, and Sean and Kelly. Uh, and I, I really enjoy doing that. And I think my my background of uh, being on both the lender and borrower side, I've, I've kind of seen it all. And so I think I can bring that to the relationship. And I've been, as you indicated, I, I've been in a big firm. I've been in a small firm. And uh, I am just in the process of uh, starting my own firm, which has uh, been interesting in these times, uh, trying to uh, get things started when you can't necessarily see people face to face. It's been, it's been fun, and I'm, and I'm really looking forward to it. Well, I, I think uh, starting a new company right during a, a pandemic that's unprecedented like this is certainly going to present you with some unique challenges. But I mean, that, I think that's a really good segue into, you know, we went from 08, 09, and it's been good, good, good. And then with with no end in sight, really. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, landlords are in a very unique position and many landlords are having tenants that are struggling and when you have tenants struggle i mean i always tell my tenants your success is my success so you want them to do well you know what have you been seeing out there with from a standpoint of of landlords maybe needing to get assist their you know, tenants with assistance, rent assistance, and have you seen any tenants that might be taking advantage of the situations? What, give us a rundown of what you're seeing I, and kind of what landlords can do. 
Yeah, I've seen the time. whole spectrum, and and you know, there I did. I do have a landlord uh, that you know called once and hey, my tenant didn't pay. We need to you know kick them out. <laughs> That's oftentimes, uh, especially you know, in in the past, that was what a landlord would do. That was really their only option. At this point, um, and I talked to a lot of landlords. Uh, as a practical matter, you're not going to get a court to evict anybody right now. The the ability to go to the legal process isn't there. More importantly, I think, and and one of the things I also, I think I can uh, talk it, uh, to the clients about is just kind of the business aspect of it. Of yes, this tenant's not paying, but what is your option? And, you know, that sometimes as a lawyer or an advisor, you kind of play devil's advocate with the client. And when you have a landlord that says they're not paying, I want them out, which again is what you would typically do, um, is what's your option? There isn't another tenant that's, you know, knocking on your door to rent that space. Uh, let's, it, it makes more sense to work with the tenant. And, you know, here in Ohio, uh, the governor had come out and had requested landlords to work with their tenants, uh, not charge them rent. Um, there's a whole question of legally whether he can do that. But, uh, you know, landlords hear that as a request. Some tenants see that as, hey, the governor says you're not going to you can't collect rent from me. Um, so what I've been successful with uh, some folks is working with the tenants. And I'd also say to the tenants, if you're having trouble, contact your landlord. You, you can't just put your head in the sand. Um, but had some landlords work with the tenants and indicate, look, if you're having trouble, uh, if you can't, you know, pay what you can. And I often like to, you know, at least pay the, um, the utilities, the, the hard cost that the landlord has. Um, work on something where if, uh, if they can't pay, that once business reopens, you either amortize what wasn't paid over, you know, the life of the lease or a certain period or – some, some landlords and some tenants are even requesting that we will extend the lease by the number of months we don't pay rent. Uh, one of the things from the landlord standpoint, though, is, again, I would say work with your tenant. However, you also have to follow the documents. Uh, and, and so I'm recommending to people if, if the tenant didn't pay, if, if, you're no, if your lease you know, requires notice, and even if it doesn't, I like to give tenants notice, hey, you didn't pay your rent, you're in default, we understand why, we're willing to work with you. But you don't want to have the ability, you don't want to have a tenant be able to say, well, hey, you didn't ask for my rent, so you've waived that. Um, and again, it, a lot of this comes down to just communication between uh, the landlords and, and the tenants. Well, yeah, I think it's really, uh, uh, you know, you and I had talked before, you, you know, you have to get anything that you do throughout the period of a lease should be documented. And that's really important for a number of reasons. Uh, one, from a legal standpoint, but two, when you go to sell the property, if you have all your documents and ducks in a row for everything from legal to accounting, you are going to increase the value of your property. But that's just one thing. One other thing I've seen um, of landlords doing right now during this time is they're, they're using saying, hey, if you can pay half of your rent, we'll take the other half out of your security deposit and then coming up with some sort of agreement later on down the road, like you had mentioned, of saying we'll extend your lease by the amount of time that we are um, not paying right now. Yeah, the one thing I think from a, from a standpoint of getting it in writing is you want to make sure that the tenant uh, doesn't, doesn't have an argument that you've a waive that rent or abated that rent. It's more of, I do it more as a deferral. So, and, and as you asked the question of, you know, are tenants taking advantage of it? I think some of them potentially are because there are some businesses that are still open. And I know when I go to Chick-fil-A, that drive through is busier than it normally was. And so I would like to see, and I think you had, you know, an indication where uh, you had a tenant that was actually probably making more money now than they were prior to this just because you know, there aren't as many places open. Uh, and so you need to – some tenants are, though, saying, well, okay, we have this issue, so we don't have to pay rent. And if the tenant is still in business and still operating, I think it, it's more than appropriate for a landlord to say to the tenant, okay, you – and I think the, the way the all the – the regulations that have come down is the tenant needs to demonstrate a loss. So it's uh, a lot of leases have the ability for the landlord 
to obtain sales figures from the tenant. But if your lease doesn't have that, I think it's more than appropriate, and you would have the ability to say, we will work with you, but you need to document or demonstrate a loss. And so you need to show us your sales records. And again, if the sales records show they're making as much or you know, maybe they're making three quarters, okay, we'll, we'll work with you, but we're not just going to not collect rent because of the situation. Well, I yeah, and I, I, I think when you run into um, that situation, like you said, hold them to the lease because they have to they're gonna have to prove whether or not they're truly burdened by by the situation we've got going on but that kind of brings up uh, I think another good segue in um, you know this can be anywhere but especially in Franklin County right now with the reassessment of taxes coming up when when we're in a situation where revenues are down and revenues for a lot of people are down um, we we need to do and you should be doing this anyway but assessing whether or not how what are the ways that you can um, decrease expenses and arguably one of the highest expenses that a landlord are going to incur is out, outside of uh, their mortgage payment is going to be the taxes right so yeah you know with what could what could a a, a landlord do to you know, make sure their property is valued properly, and how, how can they kind of go through yeah. that process? Well, yeah, I always recommend a landlord, you know, review their, uh, you know, income and expenses and see if their real estate taxes are in line with basically the, the value of the property, the fair market value of the property. And this year, uh, Ohio does uh, real estate valuations every three years. Uh, this year is in Franklin County, and there's it's not all the counties right now. I forget the number. There's probably 40 counties that are doing their triennial uh, revaluation this year. Um, and what Franklin County usually does is they will let you come in and talk to the auditor before they set their values. Uh, what we what is interesting this year and, and what would typically happen is the auditor is charged with valuing real property as of January one. 2020. So the tax bill that you would receive in December of 2020 that's payable in January of 2021. And again, that's here in Franklin County. Other counties have some do February and July payments. Franklin County does January and June. Uh, but that value is supposed to be based on the value of the property as of January 1, 2020. Now you will have there will be, you know, a lot of people and school boards, uh, government entities that uh, get dollars from real estate taxes are going to say, hey, as of January 1, 2020, your property was worth X. What I would recommend doing, and I don't know if it'll happen or not, but I think it would be a good time if your property has been negatively affected and your tenant hasn't paid um, to try to get a meeting with the auditor to discuss the issue and maybe have the auditor take that they may or may not take that into account but it's worth a shot because there's probably going to be some property that might have been worth a million dollars as of january 1 2020 as of april 1 2020 is worth you know nine hundred thousand dollars um so it's just something to to think about and consider uh and look at and well, hey, I mean, that, and then I think that segues into another topic. But let me know if you had any questions about that. No, I think that's a really good, you know, from a from a standpoint of going in and talking to the auditor, and I, you know, different states do it differently. Uh, it is just if you can go in and you go in prepared and you show them, hey, this is, and I have seen this done successfully numerous times. You prove why your property it should be valued. At a lesser amount and the the auditor they're generally um reasonable when it comes to sitting down and talking about facts yeah Go and, and i would say even if you're not successful now when you get your tax bill in um december of this year and if you think it's it's wrong or you think the county you know increased it too much uh you then always have until march 31st or next the, the next business day after march 31st to file what's called a border revision complaint uh to 
reset the value of your property. And, you know, there's that's a probably a subject for a, another uh, podcast. Hayden, well, yeah, but, and uh, you, you would you know, be there are things that. you can do, and, and it's always good to have an appraiser and, you know, things like that. But, um, again, I think just on a yearly basis you should always reassess and make sure the counties well, has the right value for your property. And you would be able to help somebody guide them through that whole process. Oh, yeah, yeah. And there's a lot of good lawyers out there and that, that, that can do that. It's just something you should do. And um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend doing it on your own because there are, uh, and especially there have been more and more uh, kind of rules the county auditors have put in place and steps you have to follow. So it's uh, this well, is one of the things I will say. It's not as easy now as it was 30 years ago when I started. Well, I, I, I mean, especially now you'll see different school boards that are even, uh, they will actually hire their own attorney to go out and um, dispute different valuations on especially commercial property. And, you know, you don't want to go into representing yourself when you have another attorney on the other side that that's all they do is argue valuations. So. Yeah, and, and I guess that, I think that segues into at least another topic of just in general um, buying property. Again, as, as Hayden mentioned, you know, real estate taxes are, you know, arguably one of the biggest expenses a, 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 an owner of uh, investment property or any property will have. And oftentimes uh, when you're looking at a property, uh, again, with this pandemic may have changed some things and may have negatively affected values, but over the last several years, especially since 2011 when things did get you know start to get better and have you know real estate values have gone up you know a lot i would say uh over the last several years what you have now is when you're looking at a piece of property as an investor you may be uh, you know looking at buying a property for a million dollars that the county has appraised for five hundred thousand dollars and oftentimes when you're doing your pro formas some folks will just use, oh, well, the real estate taxes are X, not realizing if you just buy the property, the school board is going to come in nine times out of 10 and seek to increase the value of that property from $500,000 to what you purchased it for. So your real estate taxes are going to not necessarily dollar for dollar, but they will basically double. I mean, especially from 2000, you know, maybe 15 to now. Um, or in January of this year, you, the prices of property had changed so significantly that it it wasn't unreasonable to s see some some property that was purchased for five hundred thousand that then retraded for a million dollars. And when you're increasing it by that much, yeah, your your taxes are obviously going to go up. And like you said, there are ways to address this. That could be probably two podcasts full of <laughs> yes. information. But, um, and, there and, are... and I will say, and, and this will be a plug for lawyers, uh, and maybe we'll talk about some other ones. Uh, and I don't necessarily mean to talk war stories, but I think it is, is somewhat illustrative. Of, I had a client a few years ago. Uh, I received a call after he had already signed the contract. And uh, it was a situation where he was paying – double what it was valued at at the county and i just i made the comment to him are you are you aware that your taxes are going to double and he was in disbelief and he's like well it doesn't make sense at that he had unfortunately already signed the contract and there there wasn't necessarily an out for that uh but we were able to as hayden said there are ways to deal with it we were able to deal with it restructure the transaction so that we did minimize the tax increase and so I, I would recommend before you sign a contract, have a lawyer look at it. Or oftentimes, and I know the residential, a lot of residential contracts say, you know, have a five-day attorney clause. So I can sign it because oftentimes you have realtors and, uh, and brokers saying, we need to get this offer in because somebody else is going to buy it. So you know, that's fine, but you should all, always have a, a, a lawyer then look at it to make sure there aren't any gotchas. And as, as Hayden mentioned once, he said, yeah, it's like buying insurance. And I don't necessarily want to put the legal profession in the same with the insurance profession, but he's right. Uh, it may cost a little extra up front. And at the end of the day, we may say, hey, no issues at all. And you kind of scratch your head and go, why did I pay you for that? But there are more than enough examples of someone getting bit because they didn't have 
somebody look at it. Not all law firms, not all lawyers are created equally, and you want to find somebody that specializes in the type of, of legal work that you're you're engaging in. Whether you know a real estate attorney is going to be different than an insurance attorney. Um, yeah. So you, you know one of the one of the things that I have seen people do before is they they'll go on to. Uh, legal zoom or, or whatever the different websites are and they'll try to get uh, paperwork to fit their very specific needs and their very specific property and that doesn't necessarily work because you, you know one of my favorite quotes is a Don donald rumsfeld quote and you know you've got your known knowns your known unknowns and your unknown unknowns and if you know if you're working with a real estate attorney one of the best things is they're going to have they're going to have a lot better understanding of what the unknown unknowns are than you do because they've just seen more things so yeah and I, and I'll, I'll throw out another and this is actually something i uh it just finished resolving a situation where a client signed a prop signed a contract was ready to buy it and his financing fell through and he attempted to get his deposit back and they wouldn't give him the, the deposit back because there was no financing contingency in the contract. And uh, so I, he called me, and I looked at it, and my first thing was, they're right. There is no financing contingency. Um, he had been given something from a broker, though, that had a, a timeline, and, and a lot of people have these, of the various dates in a transaction of when the contract was signed, when a deposit is due, when the due diligence contingency expires. And there was a date on that line. And so he reasonably believed, I believe, that he had a financing contingency, uh, even though the contract didn't have one, uh, which anybody that would have looked at it would have realized, hey, there's no financing contingency. We were able, you know, thankfully to work something out with the seller and, and get it resolved. But you know, that's just that could have been a, a huge issue. Uh, because he didn't have somebody look at the contract. And, you know, there's all kinds of those stories, uh, surveys, another thing, and, and title issues. Oftentimes you'll buy a piece of property and not have anybody review the title and survey. And uh, you have situations where what you wanted to do with that property, there's deed restrictions or other restrictions that, that a, uh, a prior owner has put on the property that makes it impossible for you to do what you intended to do. And oftentimes you can negotiate and get that resolved, but doing it after the fact is always more expensive than doing it at the very beginning. No, I mean, you go in prepared and that will pay dividends later on in the event that you, you know, get into a tough situation after the fact. Now, We've talked a lot about uh, for active investors. It, one of the things that we, we do is we've got lots of passive investors too. And with my line of work and how we do investing, our investors who invest with us are passive. So we give them private placement, memorandum, subscription agreements, and they're not necessarily, they're passive investors, meaning they don't have to do anything throughout the investment except that initial decision and kind of vetting the sponsor and making sure the investment deal is good. But when I give them a private placement memorandum or a subscription agreement, those documents can be over 100 pages long. What advice would you give a passive investor who's looking to, to invest passively when they're going through these documents? What, what advice would you give them to look out for? Are there any red herrings that they should be aware of when, when going through something like that? I, I always, and this is, I, I got to you know, flip my hat around because I, I generally represent the developers and the folks that are, that are doing these placements and, and the sponsors and things like that. Um, I would say from you know, the, the investor standpoint, just if you have any questions, ask them. No, and more importantly, know who your sponsor is. You have to feel comfortable with, with uh, you know, who the sponsor is. You want to look at the fees. And I know, you know, uh, sometimes sponsors will take fees right off the top, whether they're making money or not. Um, you know, you want to look at that. And, and sometimes that may make sense. 
Other times you may want to look in, in sponsors that say, hey, we're going to do this, and we only get paid after you get paid. It's always feel free, and, and I, this is a cliche, and I, I hate using it, but it is so true. No question is a dumb question. Always feel free to reach out. If you have a question, ask. If you don't feel comfortable, don't do it. Um, but uh, knowing your sponsors and, and who you're working with and, and what they've done in the past, uh, again, it is, it is not uh, – you can't say what's done in the past is going to happen in the future, but you know, it will at least give you some comfort. John, I really, really appreciate you giving um, all of these tidbits, and I think that we're going to ha have a lot of listeners who – who find this information extremely valuable, but you know, with our crazy times with the the COVID nineteen virus out there, you know, things are changing very rapidly. And you know, I highly encourage you if you're a landlord to reach out to John and and make sure we're going to be putting his information in our YouTube channel and um, on our website for you to be able to to reach out to him. But um, could you? John, tell our listeners how they might be able to reach you. The best way, and, and you know, fortunately or unfortunately, and my wife usually says, unfortunately, I always have with me my cell phone, which is 614-296-1281. I will, it, it's, it's not up yet. It will hopefully be up by, by uh, later this week. My new website and my email address will be Gleason. That's J G L E A S O N at Gleason Law Office LLC dot com. Again, Gleason Law Office LLC dot com. I appreciate uh, you listening to me, and uh, I, th I think this. I, ho I hope this was helpful for folks, and be happy to uh, participate or uh, individuals say, "Hey, we want to know more about this topic." Uh, be happy to come back and, and you know, maybe spend more time on one individual topic because I know we. We kind of touched a lot of topics today. No, this was this was great. Getting all of these tidbits really are applicable to to today's market. Now, and to all of our listeners, I really do thank you for coming and joining us. You can join us every week on Thursdays for our podcast, and make sure you check out our YouTube channel. We've got a playlist for all of our podcasts. Subscribe, and also. Uh, check out lanaserinvestments.com slash education. You'll find all of our uh, information and educational uh, documents all in one place.